Hi. Good evening. I'm Eric Barnum. I'm the sales floor manager here at the Northshire Bookstore. Welcome to our second annual holiday bookseller presentation. Uh, tonight, oh, please help yourself to refreshments. I see you already have. <laughs> but enjoy it. Um, tonight, the booksellers will be talking about their favorite books for the, for the season. Uh, it's kind of, usually you come into the bookstore and you get a one-on-one. -on -one. This is an opportunity for the booksellers to kind of show you all their favorites and all the books that they think will be um, winners this season. Um, they, as you probably know, the booksellers here love what they do. They must because nobody's making any money selling books these days. So <laughs> um, please notice that we're being filmed tonight. Uh, at, at GNAT, um, and tonight, and tonight only, all the things that the booksellers will be talking about will be 20% off. Um, going to kick this off with Louise. Louise, you've been working here for 28 years. Louise now works every Saturday. Usually. <laughs> Usually find her in the mystery uh, section talking about mystery. She's going to be talking about a few other things tonight, too. I'll turn the mic over to her now. Thank Louise you. Jones. Thank you. I read all kinds of books, but tonight in the fiction section, I have three mysteries. And one of them is what some people would call a no-brainer. This is Archer Mayer's new book, Tag Man. And the reason I chose it aside from the fact that Archer is a Vermont writer and the books are set in Vermont, and they are very, very good mysteries. Um, uh, this is his 22nd book in the series, the Joe Gunther series, and I really think it's one of the best. Um, it has uh, rather a convoluted plot. Um, it starts out with a character who was in one of his earlier books, um, um, Question of Malice. Um, and um, he, uh, that isn't the title, what was the title? The Price of Malice, this character, and he's brought the character back to this book, and he's a rather um, confused young man who has a lot of personal problems, and the book starts out with this young man breaking into people's houses very, very quietly while they're there, uh, wanders around the house, eat some of the things in the refrigerator and leaves a little post-it in their bedroom or their de den just saying that he was there, leaves a little tag. So the police call him the tag man. And he doesn't steal anything, but it's very frightening and very disconcerting to the people who, whose houses he's, he, he enters. And it turns out that one of the houses he enters is owned by somebody who has something that he really wants to keep secret. And this leads into a much larger plot. And it's a very, very interesting book. Um, Joe has to go to Boston a couple of times to look, uh, look up some information. Um, there are a lot of other people that are brought into the plot. And also in the last book, Red Herring, uh, a woman who Joe was very, very fond of, was having an affair with, uh, was killed very suddenly. It's a really shocking end to, a to the book. And so in this book, Joe has to kind of accept what's happened in his, in his life and move on and continue. He, he even con c considers quitting, but he continues working. But anyway, it's a, very, it's a really one of, one of Archer Mayer's best. Now, this book is also the 22nd in the series, Sue Grafton. Now, Sue Grafton has been, Archer's been writing for about 22 years. I mean, he writes a book a year. Sue Grafton started out with this alphabet series, writing one a year, but she was here a few years ago, and she said she's getting older, and she just doesn't want <laughs> to write a book a year. So she write, now she's writing about a book every other year. So she has four more letters of the alphabet to do, so she'll be finished in about eight years. But this also I found really fascinating. Uh, she has a very large group of characters who at first 
it's very difficult for the reader to figure out exactly what in the world they all have to do with one another, but you sort of know because you've read Sue Grafton that somehow they will come together. And it's very, very clever about how, what these people all have in common and how they affect the particular crimes that affect Kinsey, who is her private detective. Um, also, Archer Mayer's books are set in real time. These are set, she's written 22 books, and they, they take place over a course of about five or six years. This one is set in 1988, uh, just before Kinsey is 30, just when Kinsey is 38 years old. The first, in the first book, A is for Alibi, I think Kinsey was about 32 or 33. And, and so she, uh, this book is set really like a couple of weeks after the U, U is for Undertow. Um, and it's interesting because she keeps a card file and she has a big file cabinet. The police have computers, but it's really a very early, uh, early on. She has to, uh, you know, run home to use, or to her office to use the telephone. There aren't cell phones. Um, I mean, it's very much, they're not, I can't say they're historical novels because they take place, this one is set in 1988, but they're not up to date. Uh, but this one, too, I think is one of the better in the series. When you, you know, when an author writes 22 books, they're not all great. But I think that this one is very good because of the um, kind of convoluted plot and the interesting characters that she has in them. Now, this is the third mystery although I do read straight fiction. This woman, Susan Hill, is a British writer who has written quite a number of straight, regular literary fiction nov uh, books. Um, in fact, she's on the uh, board of the committee that um, supervises the Man Booker Prize. She's very highly regarded, and about maybe five or six years ago, she started writing a series of mysteries that are set in a uh, small uh, cathedral town in southwest uh, England. And the main character is a police detective who comes from that town, and his family, going back several de de generations, are all doctors. His mother and her father are doctors. His sister is a doctor. He, he's one of triplets, and his, he has a brother and a sister both of whom were doctors. And of course, the family expected him to become a doctor, and he refuses. And he's an artist and a, uh, a police uh, detective. And um, the best way to describe these books are, I, I don't know if, if you are a mystery fan, if you've ever read Elizabeth George. They're not exactly like Elizabeth George's books, but it, with Elizabeth George, too, you get a group of related characters who are, are, are um, whose personal lives become very important to the reader and to the progress of the of the books of the series, and she too, uh, Susan Hill, also develops this these this family and um, the, the the relations and the um, uh, the children, the in laws, and you become very tied up with the family and they're not necessarily involved in the mysteries, but they become very important characters in the book. She's a very good writer, and this is the sixth in the series, and this just came out. The first w one was called um, The um, Various Haunts of Men. Now, for nonfiction, this is a marvelous book. It's called The Unconquered. Scott Wallace is a writer for National Geographic. He was asked several years ago to go to the uh, Amazon, to the, to the um, Brazil, Brazilian Amazon, and uh, write an article about a, a, um, an anthro sort of an anthropologist who worked for the B Brazilian government and was uh, leading an expedition through a part of the, of the jungle that was inhabited by a, uh, a group of tribes that had, had had no contact or hardly any contact with outside people. And it is absolutely fascinating. First of all, it's very well written. The characters seem like 
you know, this is fact, stranger than fiction. Um, very exciting, uh, a very, very dangerous trip. It seems that every bit of fauna and flora are poisonous. Um, and um, while I was reading this book, I kept thinking, oh my God, I hope he I hope he gets out. And then I thought, well, of course he did because he wrote the book. But you really are, are frightened for him at many times. Um, he and the photographer, and there is one other man who is not either a Brazilian or some kind of a Brazilian a native who is along on this trip. It's a fascinating uh, story and very well written. Um, this is a very different book. This is To End All Wars. This is by the author of King Leopold's Ghost, which was about the Belgium Congo. Um, this is really uh, an examination of the anti-war movement in, in Europe, mainly in England, during the first, before and during the First World War, and the, uh, the impact that they had on the government. Um, there are a lot of people in here that you will have heard of, but there are a lot of people in here I had never heard of, never read about, although I've read a lot about World War I. And the uh, aspect from which he writes is, is really uh, fascinating because it's different from most books about the war. Now, there are also a lot of scenes in here that are set in the war, um, brutal scenes, really, which emphasize the, the feelings of the anti-war feelings of the, uh, of the characters in the book. Very, very well written and very well done. This one, Hemingway's Boat by Paul Hendrickson. Um, Hemingway died 50 years ago, committed suicide. Um, this, boat, this book starts in 1934 when Hemingway bought a boat which he named the Pilar. He was going to use it as a fishing boat uh, when he lived in Key West and then moved to Cuba. And this book is absolutely beautifully written. I've talked with a few customers who have bought the book and the first thing they say is how beautifully written the book is. Um, it's not written in Hemingway's style, but it's written about Hemingway and his one, his theory seems to be the one true love was, Hemingway's one true love was his boat. And um, uh, the people who, who, uh, who he took out on the boat, the way the boat influenced his life, um, how it influenced his relationship with his family, with his wives and with his sons. About the last quarter of it, it is about his relationship with his youngest son, Gregory, who was extremely troubled and, um, and uh, led a very, very unhappy and difficult life. And um, I've also read a lot about Hemingway, and I, and I never read this much about, about this poor young man. Um, there are also a lot of people in here who, who knew Hemingway who were very close to him who just get short shrift in most biographies of Hemingway. It's a really interesting book if you have any interest at all in Hemingway and about the whole culture that Hemingway developed uh, and influenced uh, about his friends. I mean, Hemingway could be an extremely generous friend and he could be just brutal to people who were friends of his. But everything circles around this boat, and although it sounds strange, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful sort of starting point and goes off in a lot of different directions. And then I have a book called The Swerve, which has gotten a lot of publicity. It won the National Book Award. This book is, it's sort of, it's philosophy, it's history, it's, it's intellectual and artistic history. Um, about 600 years ago, um, um, a man who was more or less a, uh, a book um, um, scout discovered a copy of a book in a monastery in Italy. And um, actually, I think it was in Switzerland. And um, it turned out to be called On the Nature of Things. 
by a Roman called Lucretius. The book had been written fa a thousand years earlier, so this was a six, uh, from our standpoint, a 1,600-year-old book. Um, it was um, a discussion of uh, natural history. Uh, Lucretius felt that there were what we would now call atoms, which nobody knew about or even thought about at the time. He questioned belief in God. He questioned the way people conducted their, their moral and intellectual lives. And uh, it was an actual, an absolutely astounding discovery. And he, the monastery would not let him take the book, so he had it copied. And the book was published, and Stephen Greenblatt, who has written about uh, Shakespeare, in fact, Eric loves his book, Will in the World, um, feels that the, the popularization of this book by Lucretius was what stimulated the Renaissance, and that he calls that a swerve, a swerve in intellectual and world history. And it's a fascinating book, and it's and it's it sounds it's not difficult reading. Let me put it that way. Even though it deals with a lot of um, maybe difficult subjects, but he's a wonderful writer and a wonderful explainer of what he's talking about. So I really highly recommend this, and I think, in fact, it may be on the bestseller list now. And I have two other books that I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about. Do I have time? Okay, these are not real new books. Feathers came out during the summer. It's, it's written by a natural historian. It's how feathers were, how feathers developed in the Jurassic period, um, what, how birds use feathers, how we use feathers. He goes to a feather factory. He goes to a, uh, he learns how to f tie flies with feathers. He does everything you can think of. He goes to a, uh, a company that makes, um, I think he may go to Eddie Bauer, someplace that makes down jackets. Um, he, he goes to a wonderful uh, business in Seattle that imports feathers, weighs them, cleans them, and then sells them all over the world to every kind of business that uses feathers. But in the meantime, he's talking about the the the, um, the 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 science of it also, and how feathers, how birds use the, use their feathers. It's really a fascinating book and very very well written. And it's a f first book by this. Um, his name is Tor. What is that? Tor Hansen, and very very well done. And then this is new in paperback. It came out about a year ago. It's called The Nesting Season by Bernd Heinrich, who is a very highly regarded. Um, a biologist. He's retired now from the University of Vermont. He lives in northern Vermont and in um, Maine. And uh, he's written, oh, I think about 18 or 17 or 18 books. Um, he loves ravens, and he's written two books about ravens. He's kept pet ravens. And this is really about how birds nest and why they nest. And, and it's really fascinating. It's um, there are some birds who, um, who mate and build the nests together. There are some kinds of birds that mate and the male builds the nest and disappears and the female lays the eggs. And some of them, the female build, the male disappears after mating and the female builds the nest. Um, and he also talks a lot about uh, human relationships with, with birds. He's had, he has a big pond where uh, in his uh, uh, on his property uh, uh, near uh, near Burlington, and he um, there are uh, there's a, a goose that he had living in his house with him, and finally uh, grew up and disappeared and mated. And every year she comes back to the pond, comes into their house, not with her mate. The mate comes close by, but she comes right back into the house again. Um, and it's really fascinating. He te he says he doesn't really want to anthropomorphize. But, 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 but the bird behavior in here is really interesting, and it's very well written and very, and very funny. He has a very good sense of humor. Well, aside from being a uh, sales floor manager here, I'm also a bookseller, and I feel a little jealous that everybody gets to sell their favorite books here. So uh, I, I'm going to bring up a couple of the books 
They are not on your list, but they're my favorite books. Um, aside from the booksellers here, does anybody know what actor the very first Academy Awards got the most votes for, act, for best actor but didn't get the award? He didn't get the award because he was a dog. Um, I love this book. Um, Susan Orlean also wrote The Orchid Thief. That's what she's most famous for. I read this book thinking it was going to be just a funny little biography of a dog, and it was going to be a good dog book. It's actually a wonderful history book. You learn not just – Rin Tin Tin is the focal point of the book. Um, he was found on a – uh, abandoned battlefield in World War I in Germany. No, in France, I'm sorry. But uh, he was found in, a, in an abandoned kennel where the Germans had killed all the dogs, except for Rennie, his sister, and his mother. Um, the man who found them really thought that Rin Tin Tin's sister was going to be the, the dog. There are, I think, th I'm, I may be wrong about this, I think there are 13 generations of Rin Tin Tin. Um, Marvelous book. You learn about dogs in World War I. You learn about the introduction of dogs into a household, which didn't really happen uh, very long ago. It was really the turn of the century. Before that, dogs always had a job. They were always outside or whatever. Um, lovely, lovely book. Um, next up is our buyer, Stan Hines. He's going to talk about a, 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 a plethora of books. And here he comes. Hey there. How are you? Um, I am Stan Hines. I'm one of the buyers here. And uh, uh, I want to talk about um, some gift books. By gift book, I mean books with pictures in them. And um, then I'm going to talk about a few books that you actually have to read, too. The first one I want to talk about is a gift book with some beautiful pictures in it. Uh, it's called Dish. My personal uh, interest in dishes is usually um, limited to whatever is on the dish. But I think all of us probably know someone who would like a book like this. My mother-in-law is getting this for Christmas. I'm, I don't think it's, a, it's okay. I don't think she watches GNAT. She lives in California. Um, but it's just a fantastic book full of pictures of dinner plates from, um, from ancient times to modern times. Um, and uh, you'll just, from, from the, um, you know, the usual suspects, you got your flow blue, your Wedgwood, your Spode. These are words that, I, that I've heard of. I don't really know what they mean, but I know they're significant for people who know from dishes. Um, uh, dishes with birds on them. We've got, let's see, I chose a, oh, this, I like this one. These are uh, New England themed dishes. These are beautiful. Um, we've got dishes, um, souvenir dishes. And we've got, we've got children's dishes. We've got Halloween dishes. Anyway, it's, a, it's a great book. It's really beautiful. The, the reproductions are terrific. And um, I think everybody has somebody, someone on their list who would like this very much. Um, a book that you have to read. Uh, first novel by Chad Harbach, The Art of Fielding. Um, the author is the co-founder and co-editor of a literary magazine called N Plus One. Uh, this was my second favorite novel that I read this year. Would have been my favorite if it hadn't been for that other book that I read, um, which was my favorite. I'll tell you about that one. Um, this, uh, this book is like reading a Richard Russo novel. If you like Richard Russo, I think you're going to like this book very much. Um, it, it's also a book uh, for people who like sporting fiction. Um, it's about baseball, the best sport. And uh, it's about a, a young man, he's a shortstop, and he goes to a small liberal arts college in Wisconsin and uh, quickly goes from being a scrawny guy with some talent to being a pro prospect. Um, his, um, his roommate is uh, a, uh, also a member of the baseball team, gay of mixed race, and he gets involved in a relationship um, that, uh, that is uh, dangerous for him. Um, but the book really is about uh, Henry Scrimshander, the shortstop, uh, and the ensemble cast that surrounds him. Great dialogue, great characters. It's just an absolutely absorbing book. Again, if you know people who like Richard Russo, I highly recommend this book.
when I'm at the doctor's office and I'm flipping through uh, the New Yorker magazine, I always um, look for the cartoons by Roz Chast first. She's my favorite. Uh, and this is a new book of her cartoons. Uh, none of these have been published before. Um, most of her cartoons um, have to do with her neuroses. And this is an ABC book of her personal neuroses. And uh, each letter has one of her funny cartoons and some, she's a good writer too. Um, a is for alien abduction and B is for balloons. Some of these we're all scared of. Many people are f frightened of carnivals because of the clowns. I'm looking at you, Karen. But um, <laughs> here's doctors. And, um, but then there are some things that you might um, be surprised to find in here, for example, Jello 123, which was a popular dish at one time, or, or I don't know how popular it was, but it was an actual dessert at one time. Anyway, uh, this is a very funny book by one of the funniest New Yorker cartoonists, and I like this book very much. Um, we'll save that one and talk about this one. This, I guess, could be uh, one of my favorite gift books uh, of the season, Relics by Peter Neskretsky. He uh, did a book maybe five years ago called The Smaller Majority that he wrote and, and provided the photographs for that was about the tiniest organisms, not the tiniest organisms, the, the smaller animals that you can see with the naked eye that inhabit our Earth. 99% of, of animal life on Earth uh, is smaller than the human finger. Um, fantastic nature f photographs in this book called Relics. And I have, to, I have to read the jacket flap because it describes it better than I can ad lib it. Um, he, de he defines the concept of a relic uh, as a creature or habitat that, while acted upon by evolution, remains remarkably similar to its earliest manifestations in the fossil record. Now, um, I, I, I kind of knew what that meant because um, uh, horseshoe crabs are the, are the one animal that I knew that they've, they've been here for, I didn't know this, but I memorized it, 400, 440 million years horseshoe crabs have, have been on this earth. And so there are many, many other creatures that have been on this earth for a very, very long time, but have changed very little. There's all kinds of insects. There's all kinds of reptiles. There are, there's a, a reptile for you. I don't know how well this is coming through. Um, plants as well, because there, uh, there's a lot of information about habitats in this book as well. And there, ah, and here's the horseshoe crab. Uh, it's it's uh, amazing photography, and this is the kind of he he wrote it and did the photography. Um, it really makes you appreciate what people who do these kinds of books have to go go through, t because I mean you know you just don't go to the zoo and you don't go to where the cr the critters are hanging out waiting for you. You've got to go out in the field and and wait endlessly for something to show up, and 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 he does this, and we benefit with these fantastic photographs. This is nature photography at its best. So that's for the nature photography person on your list. My favorite novel of the year is uh, Salvage the Bones by Jesmyn Ward. Um, Louise mentioned that Swerve won the National Book Award for nonfiction. Salvage the Bones won the National Book Award for fiction. Um, I read this book months ago uh, in an advanced reader's edition. The publisher sent some out. She sent, he sent one to Louise, too, who, who will vouch uh, for the book as well. And I just fell in love with it. A as, I, as I began to read it, um, I thought, this is strong writing. Not a lot of plot's going to happen here. Good characters, but it's all, all about the writing. And at some point, maybe 50 pages in, I realized this is extremely powerful writing by a very, very talented author. Um, it's about um, uh, a 15-year-old girl uh, living on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. Um, in a poor black family, she has no. Mo her mother has died. Um, her father is doing the best he can, but n which is not very good. She has three brothers. One's obsessed with basketball. Her little brother just tags along for all their adventures, and her closest brother <coughs> um, has a dog, a china white pit bull, that um, he is obsessed with and loves dearly, and and fights. Uh, there's a bit of dog fighting in this book, um, and all I can say is. Uh, uh, 
I wouldn't want that to uh, prevent you from reading what is an absolutely fantastic book. But the book is really about Esh, uh, the young woman at the center, and how she is going, what she is thinking as she's dealing with this pregnancy. But swirling at the edges of of, uh, of the story, uh, literally, is a storm which is bearing down on the Mississippi coast, on the Gulf Coast, and it is Katrina, and. Um, they are preparing for this storm. And uh, the last two chapters of this book, when the storm hits, um, and of course you know it's going to hit and it's going to, and it's going to uh, wreak ha havoc on their lives. It is just edge of your seat kind of writing. It is just an amazing book. And I was so very pleased when they called her name on the night the National Book Awards were presented two weeks ago. She's very deserving. And this is her, I mean, this is, where she comes from. She writes, she, you know, she came from, Jasmine Ward uh, comes from the Gulf Coast of Mississippi um, and um, has had, because she is so talented, uh, has had an um, uh, amazing early career. She received her MFA from the University of Michigan. She's a Stegner Fellow at Stanford. She was a writer in residence at the University of Mississippi and is now uh, teaching creative writing at the University of South Alabama. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, another book that you have to read, Extra Virginity, is a book about olive oil. And it is everything you ever wanted to know and never even thought about knowing about olive oil. And I mean everything. Um, the historical significance, um, particularly during uh, ancient times, uh, the religious significance, the politics of olive groves, commerce and corruption of which there is a lot of, and there's a lot of corruption in the Italian olive oil business. Um, if you buy your, if you buy your Bertoli at the supermarket, y and, and I do enjoy it, but you're not necessarily getting what the label says. Um, there, uh, you might be getting a blend of olive oil. You might be getting a blend of olive oil and something else. Uh, it's, you know, but it, it'll, it'll make you, like me, uh, want to go to Italy and taste the real stuff. You know, truly virgin, cold pressed, first pressing, you know, right on the farm. Uh, it's a really fascinating book. Not for everybody, you know. I mean, this is for somebody who's really interested in food literature. Um, I would think that somebody who's read a lot, for example, um, uh, uh, books about wine, would also enjoy a book like this. Very good book. This is just out. So whoever you're getting this for probably doesn't have it yet. Um, I wanted to pick one little book for, uh, for um, Stocking Stuffer, and I picked this one. Um, Banksy is a British artist. I don't think anybody even knows who he, who he really is. But uh, he's a muralist, graffiti artist, mm, political activist. Um, his, uh, he's got a book that we sell very well. We've sold over 150 copies of his previous book, Wall and Peace. Well, this is a little perfectly shaped book for the stocking um, of a lot of his work. He, you know, he, he does it in public places, kind of has a stencil look to it, um, kind of subversive. So you have, if you have a subversive young person on your gift giving list, this is the per perfect gift for them. And I would say that if you want to get it, get it tonight because this, this is 20 bucks. And I know it doesn't look like a lot of, lot of book for 20 bucks, but you get your 20% off tonight. Um, um, but anyway, it's, it, and the reproductions are really good. It's a very interesting book for the right person. I have uh, only seen, this is my last one, I've only seen three Stephen Sondheim musicals. Um, and, but, you know, you don't have to see more than one or two to realize. Uh, the genius that's at, w at work there, and uh, his his new book, which is "Look, I Made a Hat," which is the sequel, so to speak, of last year's "Finishing the Hat," is out. Um, probably uh, never going to get uh, an autobiography from Stephen Sondheim, but his collected lyrics. This one starts at Sunday in the Park with George, which was 1981-ish. Um, there are many, many personal reflections and annotations of his incredible career. Um, so, uh, we, and we did very well with finishing the hat last year. So if you've got a musical theater person on your list, uh, this is the perfect gift. And that's what I have for you. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, another book that's not on your list, that's one of my favorites from this year, <laughs> and you'll get 20% on it tonight. Harry Belafonte's bi bi uh, autobiography, his memoir, is just brilliant. Um, I've never read a more honest biography. Uh, most of the biographies or, or memoirs that you read are apologists for their lives or they're, you know, they gloss over stuff. Harry Belafonte, when he was a jerk, he says, I was a jerk, <laughs> you know. Um, he always considered himself an actor. He was, uh, even though his, his, his main uh, claim to fame is his singer, Deo and all that, uh, he also never met a cause he didn't like. Um, there's some really harrowing stories of his, of his time as a civil rights activist, as the conduit between Martin Luther King and the Kennedys. Um, he tells this, in the very beginning of the book, he tells a very uh, scary story of, of having to deliver $40,000 to SNCC uh, in 1968 in Mississippi um, in cash. And he called up Sidney Poitier and he said, oh, you have to come with me. And Sidney said, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> 1960 in Mississippi. Uh, uh, Sidney comes off as kind of a wimp. Uh, but they do arrive in Mississippi only to find uh, the local rednecks following them in pickup trucks with planks on the front so that they can push the car. Um, luckily, the, their friends in SNCC show up to save the day. That's just one of the stories in here. This man has led an um, incredibly uh, um, interesting life. I, I highly recommend this biography. Uh, next up is Jess, are you next? No, Sarah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sarah, how long have you been here? 20 Since 1980. I mentioned how long they've been here so you know that these are professional booksellers. These are not, <laughs> these are not register jockeys. They've been here for a while. They know what, they, and they love what they do. <laughs> uh, Sarah Knight is, uh, takes care of the mystery section. Uh, she's going to talk about a few different books tonight. Sarah, come on up. The first book I want to talk about tonight is a travel book. I am a big traveler. I will go any place, any time with anybody and do anything if it's out of my house and down past the end of the block. I love to travel. I love travel guides, I love maps, I love Lonely Planet guides, and I love these specialty books they're doing. This is Lonely Planet's A Thousand Ultimate Sites. And it is a travel book, but it is very different. It's quirky, it's iconic, it's kind of crazy. It hits the major places all over the world, but it also hits unusual places, places you might not think of to go. It does not organize them by continent or country or anything like that. It organizes them by topics. Best sunrises and sunsets. Most vertigo and in inducing cliffs. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Greatest geysers. Most astounding ego trips. There's photographs, best underground sites. There's photographs of places. They're all over the world. So if you wanted to go to the best underground sites, you may not be able to afford it because they might be on all the continents. But it is a really fun book. It's a paperback book. It has lots of beautiful color photographs in it. And I think it would be, it's $22.99. I think it would be a great gift for someone who either A, likes to travel, likes to think about travel, likes kooky places, likes to read about weird places, regular places, and just be entertained. It would be a fun book to give a family if you had to go someplace for a holiday as a house gift because they could read it, we, they could read it aloud. Most unusual fountains. Unusual predators in action, greatest geysers, you know, you've every, a topic for everyone. And I think it would make a really fun gift and it's only $22.99. Okay, 
This is a more serious art book. This is Annie Lebowitz's Pilgrimage, and it's very different from most of her photography. It's not fashion. It's not famous people. It's photographs that she took of places that she was interested in going. She decided that she was going to go and photograph places that she wanted to see. She started out at Emily Dickinson's house. She took a, t a small, just um, regular camera, nothing fancy like she usually uses, and she took interesting pictures. This is the only known dress remaining of Emily Dickinson's. She went to Niagara Falls, which I love, which is also on the cover with her children. She went to all kinds of places in America, and a few in Britain, too. She went to Graceland, took this picture, not of Graceland, not of Elvis, but of a TV set he shot up. <laughs> so if she always has a good eye. She's always looking for the unusual. This is the garden at Thomas Jefferson's. So all these photos are wonderf wonderfully, they're most, of, most of them are American, and they're wonderfully American, and they really, they really give a different glance at our country and places that you can go in it. These are Annie Oakley's boots. And this was a museum, I think, in Ohio or someplace. And this, when Annie Oakley went on the road, she used to uh, shoot a bullet through a heart in a card, and this is a picture of that. So this is a really wonderful book, and it's a different look at Annie Lebowitz. She also, there's also a lot of comments about everything, and the introduction is by Gor Doris Kearns Goodwin. So I would recommend this book as a gift. It's a really nice gift for somebody you really like who's interested in photography. Okay. Now we go on to fiction. I'm a big fan of Don DeLillo's. I have been for years. And this is nine short stories written between 1979 and 2001, The Angel Esmeralda. His stories take place in New York. They're about New Yorkers. He's a wonderful writer. He's considered one of, one of the better writers in our country. And he has a way of taking quirks that people have, making them interesting, and incorporating them into stories. Um, they're... When you think about it, most everybody has some kind of quirk. If you think of your friends or people you work with, there's something weird about all of us. But how many of us can write about it and entertain and make a living at it? <laughs> yes, the story, the, the title story, The Angel Esmeralda, takes place in the South Bronx, and it's told from the point of view of an older nun who has lived there most of her life, and she and a younger nun are basically trying to save the children in the neighborhood from the drugs and everything else. And there's a young girl named Esmeralda that they are trying to help, though she doesn't want their help. And one day, she's found brutally murdered. A few weeks later, parishioners start coming in and talking to the nuns and telling them about the appearance of an angel, and they think it's Esmeralda. So the nuns get themselves together one evening, and they go down on some highway in New York. I forget which highway. And as the sun sets on a billboard, appears a vision of this girl. It's only for a few minutes, but it's appearing every night, and every night more and more people come. It's a wonderful story. Another story is called The Starveling, and it's about, and this is something I like to do, is go and go to movies all day. Just take a day and go someplace and go to see five or six movies. And this story is about a man, an older man, who has compulsively goes to movies. Every day he gets up and he plans out what movies he's going to see, and he plots out the fastest way to get there from one movie to the next by public transportation. And one day he's in a theater and he sees this young woman sitting in front of him. And he's attracted to her, even though he can only see the back of her head and her hair, but... Anyway, so he decides to follow her to see what kind of life she lives. So she also goes to a couple of movies during the day. So he follows her for the whole day until, they, until he ends up in front of her apartment building and you know, he goes home. 
But th that's the kind of stories that are in this book. They're wonderful. And now I'm going into the mystery genre. I only have a couple. This is called Calling Mr. King. Mr. King is a hitman. And as one of my coworkers said, you can't describe a hitman as delightful. But Mr. King <laughs> is delightful. It's a, very f it's a very light read if a book about a hitman can be a light read. He, go, he, he works for a company. I didn't know there were companies that employed hitmen, but apparently maybe there are in this world. And he goes to the major cities, uh, New York, London, Paris, Barcelona, whenever he's called on a job. And in one of the jobs, he's waiting around and the person he's supposed to kill doesn't show up. And he goes into a gallery and he discovers fine art. And he subsequently becomes obsessed with fine art. Pretty soon he's planning his hits about where they're, where they're located between what museums, what art shows, what openings. And he misses a couple because there's no fine art near where they want this person killed. And his company gets upset with them. At the, towards the end of the book, he goes to um, Barcelona where he really mu runs amok with all the architecture and the museums. And at one point, he kind of just goes through the day, does two hits in between his fine art viewing. This is very fun. This is a paperback original, and it's a, good, it's a good read for people who like mystery or people who like fine art. Okay, this is another mystery. This is, a, I think, the eighth in the series by um, Martin Limon. And this is, these, his books are set in South Korea in the 70s. His characters are two army detectives. Bascom and Suenos. And they have to patrol and police the military who are stationed there. In this, in this, uh, this episode, a young mother is brutally raped and killed on a train, a Korean woman. And the people, the witnesses all say it was done by an American serviceman. They try and locate the servicemen the, um, the commander and the upper people and the military there, Stonewall, even their own detectives, the Korean detectives, they don't want to have, they'll know this couldn't happen and our soldiers wouldn't do anything like that. So, um, so there's, there's getting to be a lot of contention from the Koreans about this murder not being solved. So finally, they turn to this very famous Korean detective whose name sounds like Kill. They, he's called Mr. Kill, and he's very ferocious, and he's really kind of a mild-mannered little dorky guy who they keep running into, but they don't realize that he is this ferocious, legendary, ferocious investigator. And they work with him and solve the case. And I hope that Mr. Kill appears in future books because he's a wonderful character. And this is a great read for people, for mystery readers, and people are interested in Asia, people are, who are in the Korean War, anybody who is interested in mystery. Okay, now away from the mysteries. Last year, one of my favorite books was a book called Momofuku, which is about these trendy restaurants in New York. And they had lots of recipes and lots of writing, but they didn't have anything about desserts. And they have a very famous dessert bar in New York. And so what they did was they got the, the woman who's the, um, the chef, Baker, uh, to write a book about her desserts. And what she does is she takes childhood favorite desserts that you and I ate and turns them up, uh, upside down. She uses coffee grounds. She just uses all kinds of uh, unconventional things in her recipes. My favorite, that she, my favorite thing that she does is she uses the milk in the bottom of cereal bowls and she and the cereal milk. There's a whole chapter on things you can make with cereal milk. And they also sell the cereal milk at the stores. So I've been, I have been eating cereal in the morning and then using the milk for my coffee. And it's quite tasty. <laughs> 
she also makes cookies which they sell at their store. This is a berries, berry and cream cookie. And we were given some of her cookies, but uh, the staff. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have the cookie to show you. There's also a confetti cookie which really looks like confetti. I'll show you. the. Here's the wrapping which I took out of the garbage after everybody consumed them. This is what the cookie looks like. It's a very fun book. Uh, the recipes, some of them are very easy, some of them are very elaborate. But if you know people who are real foodies or people who like to read about food, I don't really like to cook, but I like to read these books and then have people bring me these cookies so I don't have to make them myself. But this is a, for a foodie, somebody who's interested in food, someone's interested in desserts, this is a really great book. When uh, Matt Kish was a young boy in the 70s, he was at his grandmother's house and he happened to see the old Gregory Peck movie, Moby Dick. And he fell in love with it as a, he must have been just before junior high school age. And it became a favorite of his. And he read it, and it wasn't until maybe eight years later that he actually read it in the original and thought some of it was pretty boring. <laughs> But he fell in love with the whale. He fell in love with the whole idea of Moby Dick. And so what he decided to do was to illustrate it, illustrate the book he wanted to read. So he took, he, st he spent, I don't know how many pages there are in it, but every day, he also was a, an obsessive doodler and drawer. Every day he did a picture for another page in Moby Dick. He spent ages and ages doing it, illustrating the page and what happened in it and how, he, how it looked to him. He did a lot of collage. He, you know, cut out, he did a lot of just kind of, kind of fun kinds of artwork. And the, and the whole book is like this and it's really wonderful. I like it better than the original Moby Dick. And for someone who likes art, someone who likes classic literature, this would be a great gift. The last book I have here is another travel book. This is Another Lonely Planet, the travel book, a journey through every country in the world. There are over 200 countries listed in this book. Each country gets two pages five photographs, <laughs> and then a little blurb giving information about the country. And you think, oh, my goodness, um, just five pages and a little blurb. But there are five beautiful photographs from Lonely Planet books, guidebooks done by their photographers. And then there's all kinds of information. And this little bit of information gives you so much information, when to go, the top 10 things to see, top 10 things to do, um, what to read before you go, movies to watch about it what to, what before you go, what to read about their food, what to, food and drink. Um, and then at the end, it has a little, a little kind of, they, he call, they call it um, random fact. The one for the Czech Republic has, did you know that sugar cubes came from Czechoslovakia? Just little things. This is really another, this is only $30 and it's quite a big impressive book. It's a good, good value for your money. And again, it's for people who like to travel, people who would dream of traveling, people who have traveled and might want to look at places they've gone. There are 200 countries here. You could even give it to someone who thinks they're a really world traveler and say, here, how many places have you been to? They're in this book. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, I want to tell you about the kind of book experience that I absolutely adore. Uh, many months ago, uh, the Random House sales rep came to me and said, I have a book for you. You have to read this book. You're going to love this book. I said, okay, well, what, it's, what is it about? She said, well, if I tell you what it's about, you won't want to read it. Um, sure enough, uh, a few weeks later, the book, the, a galley of the book, advanced reader's copy came. And sure enough, it had everything I hate in a book. Um, well, 
the Night Circus by Aaron Morgan Stern. Um, I even didn't really like the author biography. Um, it's about a pair of rival magicians, real magicians, who uh, train their protégés to battle for them or to, to have a... Uh, it's not the kind of book I normally pick up and read, um, but I was captivated from the very first sentence. It is a charming, charming book. Um, it is incredibly involving. I mean, I was just I was just taken with it from the very beginning, read to the end, and just loved it. Highly recommend it. Um, it's it's and Sarah has read it too and loved it. Wonderful. It really is wonderful. I was just dragged kicking and screaming to this book, and I didn't want to read it. I didn't want to read it, but I finally did. And darn it, she was right. Yeah, I, also just, I also listened to the audio. Oh, you did? Yes, Is the audio good, too? Oh, yes. Oh, great. Maybe I'll do that, too. Um, anyway, uh, next up uh, is Jessica Wood. Do you want to admit how long you've been here? 22 years in January. 22 years in January. Uh, Jessica is, Jessica was the, uh, is the head of the children's department, uh, is kind of, and also by sidelines for the store. Sidelines uh, used to be known as non-book items. They're all the things that aren't books in the store. Um, she's going to uh, talk to you about her recommendations for children's books and also for our adult gifts and children's gifts. So, thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Before I begin, I want to mention our Book Angel program. That is an 18-year tradition here at Northshire Bookstore. Firstly, I really would like to thank the community for supporting this program for 18 years. It is a program that puts books in the hands of children who would benefit from the gift of a book or who do not have books in their lives. The Morrows are very supportive of this program and support us in all of our efforts to make this happen for children. The Book Angel Tree is up in children's this year, as, as it is always, and we have probably close to 500 angels to fill. We, we end up making this happen every single year, and um, please come in ask for more information or guidance. Uh, we accept a lot of different help with this program and it's very appreciative. So that was my, uh, that's, it's a very important cause to me and it happens at a very busy time of year but in the end it all works out and makes us all feel really good. So I'm going to start with children's books and I'd have to say that Wildwood by Colin Malloy, who is the um, uh, lead singer and lyricist of the Decemberists, and his wife, Carson Ellis, have put together a trilogy of books um, set in Oregon. The thing I love most about this book for children is the intelligence in which it is written. It does not speak down to children. The language is beautiful. There is language in here that might be challenging but is worth learning for children. It lives in our middle reader section, which is generally speaking for ages 8 to 12. I recommend this book for children ages 9 to 13. There are pockets of darkness in it, but they work for the story. It starts out with a young girl named Prue who carries around an Audubon, book, uh, Audubon guide book of, ger of birds. And she is in charge of her younger brother on a cold Saturday morning. And he is abducted by a murder of crows. And he is taken to the impassable wilderness. She treks into the impassable wilderness to find her young brother. And there she finds a culture of animals and a sort of 
uprising, uh, a revolution of sorts. Um, in the usual genre that you would find good versus evil, peace versus war. It's handled very well. I had the good fortune to meet the, uh, Colin and his wife in New York at a book convention, and they are charming. And I would have hand sold this book anyway, but meeting them made it even more attractive to me. Uh, the illustrations, uh, she does the illustrations, and they're quite lovely, quite lovely line drawings. I think that, um, I think novels should have illustrations, but that's probably why I'm the children's <laughs> book buyer. The next book I'm going to talk about is um, also a little bit heavier. This is a young adult book, ages 14 and up. It's called Shine by Lauren Miracle and was almost shortlisted for the National Book Award. And there's definitely a story there. Come see any of us if you'd like to hear about it. The reason I chose this book is that it's a very important book in that it deals with it deals with prejudice on many, many levels. And while the protagonists in this book are all teens and they are dealing with very adult issues, there is very little adult influence in their lives. It's set in the South, and it is, um, it can be very sad at times and very enlightening. Uh, the, there is violence, but it is not a violent book. It um, has to do with a young gay man and his, um, and attackers. And he's lying in a hospital bed, and his childhood friend is telling the story of their friendship in childhood, childhood and when they became teens, how their friendship was severed, and how she feels that she needs to solve this mystery and this crime for him. It's very, very well done and I recommend it highly. The next book is um, every holiday season there is a children's cookbook that is very very popular and um, I can't keep on the shelves. Last year it was the Harry Potter cookbook. Normally it's a cookbook for younger children but between last year and this year it's a cookbook for older kids and this is the unofficial official Hunger Games cookbook. And there are actual recipes in here. And the beginning of each recipe has a quotation from the book and the chapter that, it w that it's taken from. Um, as you all may know that the Hunger Games is a huge phenomenon right up there with Harry Potter. I know quite a few adults who have also read the book and have enjoyed it. What I've heard, um, from my rep at Scholastic is that the people making the movie are really first and foremost guided by the book and encourage people who are interested in the movie to read the books first and I, I applaud this. The next book is Brother Sun, Sister Moon. St. Francis of Assisi's Cantic Canticle of the Creatures, reimagined by Katherine Patterson, illustrated by Pamela Dalton. This is one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 best illustrated books of the year, and it is lovely. Katherine Patterson is a dear friend of the Northshire Bookstore. Uh, we've had her qu here quite a few times. She's a lovely, lovely woman. This book is gorgeous. The illustrations are lovely. As usual, Catherine's writing is stellar. The afterword where she talks about reimagining St. Francis of Assisi and um, what it meant is, is also worthwhile. 
reading, definitely worthwhile reading. Um, this is just one of those treasures of a picture book that I think everyone should look at. Red Sled by Lita Judge is a mostly wordless picture book. And I say this um, because the words are in the book are mostly sounds. I am not very good at making sounds, but they are mostly sounds, and the illustrations are beautiful. Lita Judge lives in New Hampshire. She comes into the store occasionally, and she's, she's a lovely woman. And the, the full-page illustrations are gorgeous. I love wordless books. When my son was 18 months old, we used to read the Carl books all the time and change the story every time we picked it up. A House in the Woods by Inga Moore. I would like anything that this author, illustrator did. She is quite distinguished and well-known. She, her work in children's literature, in children's illustration is, is just beautiful. I think that I was drawn to this book mostly though by the moose walking because it's just, it's, his characteristics throughout the book is wonderful. What happens is it starts out with two little pigs who have built homes next to each other, one a den and one a small hut. And one day they come back from their explore to find that a bear has taken up residence in one of their houses. And the bear is way too big for the pig's hut. And then they look next door and they see that a moose has taken residence up also. Their homes are destroyed, but they all sit down on a park bench and think about how to handle the situation. It's all very civilized. So they call in the beavers. <laughs> And the beavers come along and they build a beautiful little cozy house that is quite lovely. And after the uh, job is done, they have peanut butter sandwiches. And they all, as they say, live happily ever after. And I must show you the picture of the cottage because I certainly would like to live there. The beavers <laughs> have outdone themselves. You know, this one we have categorized as a toddler book, but I certainly think that a five-year-old or a six-year-old would enjoy it. The piece here to remember is the animals all working together for a common cause, and it, the message doesn't hit you over the head, but it certainly is underlying, and I think various ages will take different things from the, from the book. The Barefoot Books World Atlas, written by Nick Crane, illustrated by David Dean, is a wonderful young person's atlas. It has a fold-out map, it has a small booklet on each page, and each page folds out. The nice, the thing I like about this atlas is it's defined more by it, yes, by the geography of the country, but it focuses on the cultures of the country and how cultures can form a country. And Barefoot Books is one of our favorite publishers. They do beautiful work. They are, their eye is always towards global and natural and children and changing the world. And I found this one of, to be one of their loveliest endeavors yet. And it's um, very easy to look at. It's not confusing to small children. And it's a really good atlas. It's a very good introduction to learning the cultures and the geography of the world. This next book is not on your list. I, I had to sneak it in because it's one of my favorite books of the year, one of my favorite picture books. I will extend a 20% discount to anyone who might be interested. It's Stuck by Oliver Jeffers. And this is about a young boy who gets his kite 
stuck up in a tree. And the young boy then proceeds to throw every single thing imaginable up in that tree to get the kite down, including an orangutan. <laughs> I love this man's illustrations. I love his sense of humor. I love his sensibility. His books are all very sensitive, but humorous at the same time. His illustrations are unique and thoughtful. I think that his themes stretch children, and they all have a commonality about how children do tend to worry sometimes. And you see this young kid in his bed worrying about how he's going to get his kite down from the tree. And then the last picture is everything he's thrown up in the tree saying, hey, wait, I've got, a, I've got an idea. Hang on a minute. I've got an idea. The last book I'm going to recommend is, is really, um, it's a book about my favorite actor, Spencer Tracy. Um, it is an exhaustive but not exhausting biography of him. It's very, very different from any other biography I've read of him. Um, to my mind, Tracy was probably the best screen actor that ever came down the pike. Um, a friend of mine used to say that no matter what was coming out of his mouth, you always knew what he was thinking. And um, this biography... Um, puts the lie to a lot of uh, the earlier biographies who claim that he was a nasty drunk and he was a horrible man and all that. Um, he, uh, the author, James Curtis, had exclusive, uh, uh, he, uh, Spencer Tracy's daughter, Susie, gave Tracy's papers to the author. No one had ever read them before and Tracy kept a lot of papers. Um, he, she, he, the author also had access th via Catherine Houghton, Catherine Hepburn's niece, to everything that uh, Catherine Hepburn had. Uh, very complex man. Yes, he was very troubled. He had a photographic memory, which I didn't know. Um, fascinating biography. I really thought it was just by the size of it <laughs> that it might be a little bit too much, but I loved it. I just finished it. Uh, about a week ago, and it really is a marvelous, marvelous biography. Um, last up for our uh, evening is uh, the person who takes care of our literature section, Karen Frank. Karen has been here... Uh, I'm a newbie. I've only been here 11 years. 11 years. Um, and uh, those of you who frequent the North Shire know that this is her domain. Um, Karen, please. Um, I didn't do just fiction this year. I did some interesting other stuff. This is a great little cookbook called um, Make the Bread, Buy the Butter. The woman is uh, uh, lost her job and you know, was looking for things to do and for ways to economize. So she decided to, She it was actually precipitated by her going to the store and seeing um, that Smucker's was selling for like $5 frozen peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and she couldn't believe that this was true <laughs> and that her kids wanted her to buy them. And so she proceeds to um, basically give you recipes for all these things that you could make if you had the time and you didn't have a job or even, you know, even if you did. So the recipes are great. I haven't actually, I just finished it, so I haven't um, actually tried any of the recipes. What's great about it is, though, it's hilarious. I have never actually sat down or read a cookbook from um, front to back, but she starts off by saying things like, you know, she always gives you how much it would cost you to buy it and how much it would cost you to make it. Then she tells you um, how difficult it is, and her, it starts off by being piece of cake, you know, easy. And the last thing I believe that she does is uh, southern fried chicken, and when she says how, <laughs> how hard it is to make, I believe it's just one word, epic, you know. <laughs> So anyway, it's really good. It's it's um it's you know it's for people who just want to do some things your, yourself. Um, one of my favorite fiction titles um, this year is called White Truffles in Winter by N. M. Kelby. 
this is uh, something that I just received from a publisher to give a try. I picked it up and I did not put it down. I literally, re you know, read it pretty much in two sittings. And it is a fictional um, account of the chef Le Scoffier, and it takes place during, you know, the two world wars. He is the famous chef that pretty much changed cuisine for the world. And there's all kinds of wonderful character, historical characters in it like Sarah Bernhardt, and I believe even Ho Chi Minh is in this at the very end. It's great read. His wife was a, um, was a very, uh, her name escapes me at the moment, but a, fa the f a famous poet. And they lived apart almost their entire life because he was obsessed with, you know, going to all these different places and, you know, developing this cuisine. But it's great historical fiction. Um, Louise and I both loved the new Charles Fraser book where it's pretty much divided down the middle. People that have read it here, some people really love it, some people are okay with it. He wrote Cold Mountain and Thirteen Moons. After Cold Mountain, many people were a little disappointed in uh, Thirteen Moons. They didn't feel that it was had that you know great uh, writing quality of it. This is a completely different kind of for than either of those two. I feel that this is much more um, character based. It takes place in late 1950s North Carolina. It's um, I, I can't even tell you the story because it would ruin it for you. There's so many lovely little twists and turns, and, and Louise and I both loved this. Um, if you have anyone on your list who is either a musician or a neuroscientist, this will be the book for them. I'm obsessed with, I'm, I'm an amateur musician, and I love books about the brain. And this is, you know, one in a series of many that I've read on this subject. And this is probably, I would have to say, the best one. There's all kinds of emerging brain science that, you know, that gives music a much more important place in our, in, in everything that we do. And they're, you know, learning how to use it for all sorts of different therapies. Um, they're even, you know, making some statements that uh, music affects things at the molecular level. So it's very, very readable. Um, it's not, you know, it's not a hard science book. Um, so like I said, if you have a musician or a neuroscientist. Um, Susan Cooper, I don't know if any of you, any of you lived in the Manchester area of Vermont, in fact, must know someone in the Langstaff family. Um, this is uh, uh, sort of, it's not really a biography, it's more of a, a work biography. John Langstaff is the inventor of the the Christmas Revels. Has anyone? I don't know if anyone has ever seen them. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. If you ever get a chance, the one um, that's closest to us takes place at Dartmouth. He was a folk musician, um, you know, a very talented person, who decided he he sort of almost did what um, Lomax did. He went around the country and he was always teaching music. He was always collecting folk music. He made he invented essentially the Revels, which is this wonderful community of of people it started in Boston and um, they basically take all different kinds of Christmas traditions and put them all together. It always involves a lot of music, um, a lot of theater, and a lot of community. If you ever get a chance to see the uh, Christmas Revels, definitely do so. Um, Susan will be here December 10th to talk about this book um, and you know this fascinating character, um, Jack Langstaff, who passed away, I think, two years ago or three years ago, finally. But it's a great book, too. It's a lot of history if you're interested in music. Um, at all, it's um, it's great for that. Um, I'm a big fan of this Irish Country Doctor series. This is the newest one. If anyone's read this, then you just need to get this one too. <laughs> this is um, for those of you who don't know. This is series takes place in Northern Ireland um, with a Dr. Fingal O'Flaherty, and it's. I always describe it to people as something like All Creatures Great and Small, the James Harriet books, except with people, not animals, and in Ireland. And it's, it's funny, it's, it's certainly, well, so it's a little bit like that. But it's, you know, basically an older doctor who's mentoring a younger doctor, and it's about the community they live in, it's be about the people they treat, it's, it's, you know, it's about that particular culture around that time, too. And my mother is, you know, loves these books. She, uh, she can't wait. She, I just gave her this one to read. She read it in two or three days, and she wanted to know when the next one was coming in. <laughs> so, anyway, so if you haven't, um, and actually, they kind of stand alone. This one is about the older doctor, Fingal O'Flaherty, and when he um, is in school in Dublin, in medical school, the, you know, be, um, right after World War I. And 
This is a beautiful book that no one has looked at yet. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's, I just, I haven't actually read it, but I, I picked it up because I wanted to look at it. And it's sort of a, um, this is the only thing that this man ever published. It is a, it's called The Ship That Sailed to Mars. It's, he, he did all of the uh, calligraphy for it and the illustrations and wrote the story. This is one of these things that like, um, like Peter Pan, like Winnie the Pooh, like the Tolkien books, started out as a bedtime story, a family bedtime story to read to children. And then it just, the man became obsessed with this. And it's reminiscent, the illustrations are reminiscent of um, Arthur Rackham and Edmund Dulac and any of the great uh, fantasy illustrators. It's basically about an old man, an archetypal old man figure who um, decides to build a ship with the help of the fairies to sail to Mars. And it's just beautiful. And this is, this is an art book for sure. This is not a children's book at all, but take a look at it. And then last, you may not be, this may be the last copy that we ever get in the store. <laughs> I don't know, we're having a lot of trouble getting this. This is a graphic novel, which I have not read, but I have bought two copies of it, one for my son and one for my niece, because according to people um, here who love graphic novels, it's the most spectacular and best one ever. It is basically a retelling of the Arabian Nights um, with, you know, a young man and a young woman. And um, actually, you, you've read it, right? You can tell people more about this. I, I wanted to tell it because Charles was not able to present tonight, but he loves this. And if you have a young person, well, I have to say between 16 and 30, that is, you know, they, they love this genre. And this is a spectacular uh, book. This is the only copy we have in the store right now. Yes? Yeah, we're getting more. So um, if anyone wants to grab this. And that's it for me. Happy holidays, everyone. Well, thank you all for coming. You now have 20 minutes to buy all of those books. <laughs> Please help yourself to some cider and some cookies. And uh, thank you so very much for coming. I appreciate it. Good night. Good night.